Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's Update on Lymphoma from the 2022 American Society of Hematology Annual Meeting. I'm Christina, and I'll be the operator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from an expert speaker, and you will have an opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them anytime in the Q&A box on the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of this program and gain certification of attendance. If you are listening by phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. And now, I am pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education Programs at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you, and thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's update on lymphoma from the 2022 American Society of Hematology Annual Meeting. We'd like to start by thanking our sponsors of this webinar, Bristol Myers Squibb, Kite Pharma, a Gilead company, and Pharmacyclics and Janssen Oncology. Before I turn the program over to our speakers, I wanna briefly share information with you on the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we are thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. LRF is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate this disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As we continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The Foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment-specific resources, programs, and services, all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. Most relevant to today's call, LRF offers a variety of lymphoma-specific resources, many of which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you're utilizing the web link or via LRF's website at lymphoma.org if you're on the phone. The LRF helpline can answer your specific questions about lymphoma, as well as discuss relevant treatment options and clinical trials. We also offer the Lymphoma Support Network, which is a one-to-one -one peer support program for people with lymphoma and their caregivers. We offer a variety of publications that have been reviewed by lymphoma experts to ensure you have access to the latest lymphoma information. Our mobile app, which has been recently updated called Focus on Lymphoma, is an award-winning app that provides patients and caregivers access to comprehensive content, as well as unique tools to help manage your disease. I really hope you'll take advantage of some of the great resources and services that LRF provides. If you have questions regarding what you heard about today, or if you need information about relevant treatment options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to LRF through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline 1-800-500-9976. We have a wonderful program planned for you today with two expert speakers, and I'm honored to first introduce you to Dr. Lori Sen. Dr. Sen is a hematologist and oncologist, as well as a clinical professor with the British Columbia Cancer Center for Lymphoid Cancer and the, in the, at the University of British Columbia. She's also a member of LRF's Scientific Advisory Board. Thank you so much, Dr. Sen, for speaking at our program today. I will now turn the talk over to you. Great. Thank you for the invitation to do this today. So what we're going to be talking about is some of the highlights of the recent ASH meeting that occurred in December this year. So for those of you who aren't aware, the American Society of Hematology annual meeting is one of the venues, I would say, that probably um, as hematologists, we look forward to the most during the year because it really does provide an update on cutting edge research and, and is probably the largest hematology meeting that takes place. Before I get started, I'll just acknowledge that I do have some disclosures. Uh, I do provide consulting to companies, but I, I will be giving you an unbiased opinion today. And of course, this was a very large meeting, so I'm really just providing a brief selection of some of the data that was presented to really show you where the field seems to be going. And I'm going to try to put this into the context of clinical care. So firstly, I'd like to discuss diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, which is one of the most common aggressive B-cell lymphomas that we see. We do have a current management algorithm at the time of diagnosis for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, whereby we do some uh, biology testing, which is called FISH studies, to identify a small subgroup of patients that fit into a new category 
of aggressive B cell lymphoma, which I will refer to as double hit lymphoma. But the majority of patients, so about 95% of patients have pure diffuse large B cell lymphoma. And for over 20 years, the standard of therapy has been to use a combination of what we call immunochemotherapy, which is rituximab and CHOP chemotherapy. Last year at the ASH meeting, what we saw was uh, groundbreaking information that looked at changing the new standard of care with the introduction of a novel agent called polituzumab vidotin into the upfront setting. This was a head-to-head -head comparison of RCHOP versus the combination of pola r chip And this year at ASH, um, we actually saw an update of this presentation. So to remind everybody, polituzumab vidotin is a novel antibody drug conjugate. So it is an antibody connected to a cytotoxin. And when it hits its target, namely the lymphoma cell, it gets swallowed up into the cell to directly release the chemical toxin internally. So it's a form of targeted therapy that has been a major advance. In this update that we saw at the recent ASH meeting, it was an interesting focus on what I think is an area of biology research that is really going to have an impact eventually on clinical care. Namely, the, the abstract that was presented focused on circulating tumor DNA. Along with this abstract, they did look at clinical outcomes. So now with one year extra of follow-up of this clinical trial, we saw that the message from the trial with the improvement in progression-free survival associated with the introduction of polituzumab vidotin into the frontline setting really has been maintained. But this abstract presented uh, really focused on biology, and that was looking at a potential biomarker called circulating tumor DNA. So this is an area of research across a wide range of cancers right now. What we recognize is that using a simple blood test, we can pick up specifically the DNA of tumor cells, and this has become very relevant for lymphoma. In this study, they actually uh, used a technique called CAP-seq, which is a kind of deep sequencing genetic technique to try and measure the tumor DNA or the lymphoma DNA from the blood of patients on this trial. This was, uh, I think, an important abstract because it really was the first large-scale use of this technology that we've seen prospectively in a clinical trial. And you can see from these curves that what we learned was that as early as after one cycle of treatment, so a blood test performed on the first day of the second cycle of treatment out of a six-cycle package, we can see that patients who had cleared their circulating tumor DNA, so where the tumor DNA was no longer measurable in the blood, actually had much better outcomes at the end of therapy than patients who didn't clear their DNA after the first cycle. So why is this interesting? Well, I think it really is further proof and you know, possibly the first large-scale proof that we have in lymphoma that this type of test may actually allow us to predict much sooner than waiting to partway through treatment or at the end of treatment, so even as early as one cycle, who is going to have a successful outcome and who may need other therapies added in. So this is a research and evolution, but I think a very nice example of a test that may eventually make its way into clinical care. So for diffuse large B cell lymphoma, we know that beyond frontline therapy, if patients have their lymphoma come back uh, or have what we call relapsed or refractory lymphoma, last year we saw a big shift in our algorithm. So for younger patients who are relatively fit, the standard of care has been previously to go to stem cell transplant. Last year at the ASH meeting, we saw three trials that looked at 
the comparison of an alternative approach to transplant, so using CAR T cell therapy instead of transplant for patients with high risk relapse, so those who were either refractory to their frontline therapy or who relapse within a year of frontline therapy. And based on the data that was presented last year from these three trials, two of which were considered positive, it has shifted the algorithm for these patients to, um, to move toward CAR T cell therapy rather than transplant. This year at ASH, what we saw was an update of one of these trials that was presented last year preliminarily. So it only had six months of follow-up last year. And this year we saw the important presentation of longer follow-up. So this trial looked at the comparison of the standard transplant approach, so salvage therapy and transplant, versus going immediately to CAR T cell therapy using Lysacel for patients with high risk relapsed refractory uh, aggressive B cell lymphoma. Importantly in this trial, patients who were on the standard arm could cross over to CAR T cell therapy if they were not doing well on the standard arm. And with longer follow-up of this study, what we saw is that very reassuringly Oops, sorry, I think there's a bit of a slowness here. Very reassuringly with a longer follow-up, the message is clear that patients who are randomized to CAR T cell therapy rather than our standard salvage and transplant approach actually had an improved event-free survival. They also presented updated data on overall survival. And while at present, this is not statistically significant, you can see that there is a trend to improvement, suggesting again that earlier CAR T cell therapy here may be better than waiting to use it in later settings. So what about patients who are not appropriate for transplant or CAR T cell therapy or have their lymphoma come back after? Well, we know that there's been exciting change or there have been numerous novel agents that have been recently approved in the past few years. And I've listed them here on this slide. So we now have polituzumab vedotin together with BR, a drug called Selenexor, a combination called tafacitumab lenalidomide, and a novel antibody drug conjugate called longcastuximab tesserine, all approved for patients who have received at least two lines of therapy. I think one of the big dilemmas is what order do we use these drugs in and you know, which option is going to benefit which patient? This year at ASH, we saw a very nice presentation looking at real world data of the use of tafacitumab and lenalidomide. So to remind people, this is a combination that has been approved for relapsed refractory diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It relies on immunotherapy approach. So tafacitumab is an antibody that targets CD19 and lenalidomide is a immunomodulator that corrals the immune system to help fight off lymphoma. This combination was approved based on a phase two trial that showed very high response rates of up to 60%. And importantly, what we saw is that patients that achieved a very nice response had very durable benefit from this type of immunotherapy. However, this trial had relatively small patient cohort and actually included a patient cohort that was mainly relapsed, meaning that uh, those patients who had um, very resistant disease or very early progression would not have been included. So now that this combination has made its way into the real world, investigators compiled information on patients treated with it in the United States from a variety of medical centers and put this information together. Here we've got sort of the comparison of people that were treated in the real world versus patients that were treated on the clinical trial. And I think this is an interesting uh, slide because it showed that 
of the patients treated in the real world, many of them wouldn't have been eligible for the trial. So only a minority of patients would have kind of met the criteria for the trial. So quite typically when drugs make their way into the real world, it expands into a group of patients that maybe for health reasons or other factors may have not have been appropriate for the trial. So when they looked at outcomes, I, I think that the encouraging message is this is a combination that can still have great value. It didn't have quite the same benefit as we saw in the trial, but again, I think it's because it was expanded out and partly expanded out to more patients who had much more resistant lymphoma or early, early relapse. So I think this is important information because it serves to demonstrate that patients who may most benefit are those who don't have fully refractory disease or those who get treated earlier in the course of their lymphoma. So in the idea of trying to gleam more insight into who might benefit from what treatment, this real world data suggests that perhaps this is a regimen who would be best uh, used in patients who have less refractory disease earlier on in the course of therapy. And I think it gives us some suggestion of how we may sequence the options that we have available. One thing I'd like to highlight uh, perhaps with the rest of this presentation, I think a big focus is on bispecific antibodies. To remind everybody, bispecific <clears throat> antibodies is a novel form of therapy that is coming forward. These are antibodies that target two targets. One target is a B cell target, the other target is a T cell target, and the goal is to try and bring the T cells, part of the immune system, in connection with the lymphoma to fight it off. I've listed here four of the main bispecific antibodies that are furthest along in development, and I'll show you some data showing how this form of immunotherapy is really moving forward in clinical care. In diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, we saw some important data looking at an update of bispecific antibodies for patients who had had their disease relapse uh, beyond multiple courses of therapy. This was the data on the product called Odronextimab. And in a cohort of patients with multiply relapsed diffuse large B cell lymphoma, what we saw is that this drug had the capacity to have a very strong benefit in a high number of patients. So uh, the response rates were about 50% and a fair proportion of patients actually had a complete response. So about a third of patients had complete remission. And what we're seeing is that of those patients who did respond, many of them are very durable with up to two years after treatment with follow-up, we can see many people still having a complete remission of their disease. So this is a very exciting agent that will likely be moving forward and it's quite tolerable. It does come with a unique toxicity called cytokine release syndrome, but this is something that's very manageable and in this study was shown to be low grade. So by specific antibodies, we saw more proof that they can be effective for large B cell lymphomas. There was also a trial that actually looked at using it in the upfront setting, so patients who hadn't received any prior treatment. And intriguingly, again, we can see that in upfront setting, this can be a very effective agent with, again, very high response rates of over 50% demonstrated. And in patients who responded, some very durable benefit. Moving forward to follicular lymphoma, which is the most common slow-growing lymphoma that we see. Our current algorithm relies in the frontline setting on generally immunochemotherapy, again, uh, many times rituximab and chemotherapy. For patients who need to go on to further therapy, our algorithms diverge a little bit. So patients who have earlier relapse, um, we would consider more novel approaches and perhaps more aggressive approaches because of the concern for resistance to chemoimmunotherapy. Longer relapse, um, we are more likely 
to consider either reuse of immunochemotherapy or um, the combination of lenalidomide and rituximab. So it's interesting to see that in patients with relapsed or refractory follicular lymphoma, we actually move on to an immunotherapy approach, and that is something called lenalidomide and rituximab. So at ASH this year, we saw an interesting trial that showed an update of this data of lenalidomide and rituximab in the relapsed refractory setting. I'll just highlight the main um, finding, and that was with longer follow-up of this study of the use of this immunotherapy approach for relapsed refractory follicular lymphoma. We saw that with longer follow-up, the immunotherapy approach of the combination of lenalidomide and rituximab was uh, better than rituximab alone in that it provided a longer progression-free survival. And importantly, with longer follow-up, it actually showed an improvement in overall survival. So this is a good example how a powerful immunochemotherapy can actually improve the survival of patients with follicular lymphoma. I think uh, probably the most important development we're seeing in follicular lymphoma is the emergence of bispecific antibodies. So we saw an update on the data of mosinotuzumab, which is a bispecific antibody, which has just received FDA approval based on this data for follicular lymphoma. So this antibody is given every three weeks for up to only eight or 17 treatments. And the update of this data in patients with follicular lymphoma showed a very high response rate of almost 80%. And the majority of those responders actually had a complete response. With longer follow-up, we also saw that Patients who benefited from the bispecific antibody could actually have very durable benefit. And compared to the last treatment that they received, even better benefit than they saw with their last treatment. So this, as I said, is quite remarkable. And this data has led to the FDA approval only within the last um, several weeks. So we will see this emerging finally into the clinic. And I guess this is a very tolerable type of treatment with uh, some unique toxicities that will need to be managed, but generally is a very well-tolerated therapy. And intriguingly, I'll also point out that these bispecific antibodies are now being tested in combination. We've now seen data where they have being combined with other immunotherapies. We saw data looking at the combination of lenalidomide and rituximab combined with bispecific antibodies. And intriguingly, we're seeing very high response rates. Here in this study, almost 95% uh, response rates, the majority of which were complete remissions. And looking at benefit, we're seeing very prolonged progression-free survivals. In the last few minutes I have, I'll just switch gears briefly to talk about mantle cell lymphoma, which is a different kind of aggressive B-cell lymphoma. In mantle cell lymphoma, we know that the approach for younger fit patients has been very aggressive, where in the upfront setting, patients receive not only immunochemotherapy, but a stem cell transplant. One of the most important presentations we saw at ASH this year actually was highlighted in the plenary session. And it looked at whether or not we can replace stem cell transplant by bringing in a novel agent called a brutinib forward into the frontline setting. This is a relatively complicated trial in that it had three study arms, but one of the arms was our standard approach of routine chemotherapy followed by transplant. And then the other two study arms introduced the BTK inhibitor up front um, and one of the study arms actually omitted the use of the transplant with the abrutinum. 
And the final message was that the two arms of the trial that did the best in terms of failure-free survival were the arms that contained the abrutinib over the standard approach of transplant alone. And importantly, when they looked at overall survival of transplant did not seem to affect the overall survival. So again, this was quite a powerful study suggesting that we may be able to omit transplant from these patients in the upfront setting. And I think that this may lead to a very big paradigm shift whereby we will no longer need to use transplant, but we're still in the process of digesting this information. And then finally, just one last comment on mantle cell lymphoma, similar to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and follicular lymphoma, where we've seen bispecific antibodies showing very intriguing information. There is now also very good data looking at the bispecific antibody glofitimab for mantle cell lymphoma in multiply relapsed patients who have seen our standard therapies. We've seen that glofitimab led to a very high rate of remission in the majority of patients. And in these patients, many of them had prolonged benefit. So just to conclude, I think that overall, the abstracts presented at ASH really do highlight the rapid evolution of management in non-Hodgkin lymphoma, that we're seeing the novel targeted therapies and specifically immunotherapies showing significant promise and are actually emerging as important standards of care across a variety of non-Hodgkin lymphomas. The ongoing studies are looking at use of these agents earlier in the upfront setting and in different combinations. And ultimately, uh, what we're seeing is that studies looking at biological insight, better response assessment tools such as circulating tumor DNA and real world data will likely help us to tailor treatment in these patients. Thank you so much, Dr. Sen. Um, as a reminder, we'll all take questions at the end of the program. Um, but for next, I'm now honored to introduce Dr. Pierre Luigi Porcu. Dr. Porcu is a hematologist and oncologist at Jefferson Health Sydney Kimmel Cancer Center, where he is the director of the Division of Medical Oncology and Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation. He is also a professor at Sydney Kimmel Medical College. Thank you, Dr. Porcu, for speaking at our program today. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Glad you're all here on the on the program with us. Um, so I'm going to discuss uh, a series of abstracts that I selected from uh, the the ones presented at the uh, Ash meeting uh, just last December. I am trying to move. Let's see here. There we go. <clears throat> so. Um, uh, by the way, just like Dr. Sen, I also have a number of uh, 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 disclosures in, in terms of uh, conflicts with multiple uh, uh, companies, uh, although none of uh, my disclosures are relevant really for the uh, abstracts that I'm going to show here, um, all of which are abstracts that I uh, have not been involved in uh, or uh, are investigator initiated and, and not uh, sponsored, um, directly sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. So uh, just a couple of words initially uh, in terms of framing uh, the, the, the landscape for uh, T-cell lymphomas as shown in this slide. One of the challenges historically about T-cell lymphomas is that they are a minority of all the non-Hodgkin lymphomas um, and, uh, and therefore, uh, their incidence, uh, the number of new cases and the overall prevalence is much lower compared to B-cell lymphomas. Uh, 
Another challenge uh, is also the fact that in addition to being a minority, they're also incredibly heterogeneous, both biologically as well as clinically. Um, just to make a big example, you know, the difference between peripheral T cell lymphomas involving the lymph nodes and the extra neural sites and cutaneous T cell lymphoma, completely different diseases. Um, and so that has uh, been responsible for a certain lag in the development of uh, uh, new drugs and uh, the acquisition of uh, solid data about uh, responses and outcomes. That said, um, there, there's a lot of progress that is being made um, in T cell lymphomas, and I'm going to show some of it here. Sorry, playing around with the slides here. Let's see. There we go. So the, the, the second slide of introduction I wanted to show is that we don't really know exactly uh, in the real world, so to speak, in the community, what the frequency of uh, T cell lymphoma is. We are throwing around these percentages, typically, you know, 10 to 15 percent of all non-Hodgkin lymphomas. In reality, when people look at uh, data at the population level, um, the frequency can, may actually be lower than that. So this is an example of data um, from uh, a French uh, pathology network, uh, which essentially includes most of the lymphomas diagnosed in France. Uh, and that they are centrally reviewed. This is a very large number, as you can see. And if we look at all those numbers at the, at the, at the pie chart on the, on the top left, you can see that the T cell lymphomas really represent at best six, perhaps 7% of all the lymphomas. So uh, these are, again, these are the challenges that we have to deal with um, when we're trying to design studies and uh, not just design them, but also co enroll and complete them. So looking now at uh, you know the abstract that were presented, some of them were very good uh, and, and very interesting. I'm, I have um, broken them down according to the the, 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 the framework and what the, the question that the studies addressed. Uh, so uh, when it comes to frontline, uh, unfortunately, uh, this year there wasn't a whole lot um, presented. Um, Although I have a slide at the end that will show uh, a in very interesting clinical trial that I think you all have to pay attention uh, to, which is in, in, in progress. Um, there were you know, two studies. One, uh, a, a, a study that uh, uh, was conducted in China that I'm highlighting mostly to show how not to do clinical trials uh, and how sometimes you know, there's a lot of energy and time and money that is wasted in conducting trials that are not properly designed unfortunately. Um, the other is a phase one of uh, the integration of nivolumab in peripheral T cell lymphoma. Um, then uh, a series of abstracts, uh, which I thought, you know, what, that was one of the themes for ASH this year in T cell lymphoma, which is how do we start integrating checkpoint inhibitors uh, in the treatment of patients with peripheral T cell lymphoma and cutaneous T cell lymphoma. And the blue ones are the ones that they were the oral uh, oral presentation, so the most uh, sort of impactful presentation selected by the committee. Um, there were a number of uh, abstracts and presentations uh, for for new drugs in the relapsed refractory setting, um, and I'm going to select a few of them for presentation here, and. Uh, and then uh, there were a couple of studies uh, now exploring the use of uh, cellular therapy, um, CAR-T, for example, in, uh, in T cell lymphoma, which is a field that is very slowly expanding, uh, but is very strong interest. And then studies about the disease landscape, which is we still have to map really and, and, and characterize well um, looking at uh, clinical outcomes, looking at frequency of presentation, and, and so on. So there's much we have to learn, and the good news is that uh, there, there are now in place the tools and the collaborations and the networks that are allowing us to collect uh, reliable data and therefore plan you know, for studies based on real uh, data. So in the frontline setting, as I mentioned, um, you know, the, 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 there wasn't much uh, at ASH th this year. This is uh, our frontline pathway. So how do we decide which treatment to give to patients with peripheral T cell lymphoma? And, uh, um, you know, I divide typically patients based on whether they have a type of T cell lymphoma where CHOP-based chemotherapy is considered appropriate. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, a minority of uh, types of lympho T cell lymphoma where CHOP-based therapy is not appropriate. Um, and then based on whether CHOP is a uh, type of therapy is, is uh, the way to go, then now based on the data from a published uh, randomized clinical trial, it's called Echelon 2, um, which investigated the use of brentuximab vidotin in uh, peripheral T cell lymphoma. Now we look at the expression of CD30, and that is shown here um, in this slide on the left uh, upper uh, panel. Um, so anaplastic loss of lymphoma, for example, ALK positive and ALK negative, they almost uniformly express ALK uh, CD30. Um, CD30 is, is, is expressed in a significant fraction of the angiomonoblastic T cell lymphomas and PTCL NOS, um, enteropathy associated T cell lymphoma, and less in other types of, of T cell lymphoma. So based on the CD30 expression, uh, on, the, on the T cell lymphoma. Um, then we select whether to treat patients with the new standard of care, which is brontuximab vedotin CHP, or if they are CD30 negative or low expressors, um, we use a, one of the many CHOP-based regimens, CHOP, CHOAP, or EPOC. Uh, the clinical trial that led to the approval of brontuximab, the Echelon 2, used a cutoff of uh, CD30 expression of 10%. In clinical practice, though, I and many of my colleagues use uh, even a lower uh, percentage of expression of CD30. So I give BVCHP to any patient who has a CD30 expression of at least 5%. For patients who have, you know, who are fit, uh, they have less, you know, age less than 65, uh, minimal comorbidities, then we consolidate uh, the response with an autologous stem cell transplant. For patients who do not fit those criteria, then is either observation or clinical trials of maintenance therapy. Um, so this is what is going to apply most to uh, the, the, what, the, the type of studies that I'm going to show in a second. So here is this uh, trial that, uh, you know, in principle, I think would have been quite of interest because it uh, included a combination of an HDEC inhibitor called chitamide uh, which is similar to uh, some of the other HDEC inhibitors like Vorinostat, uh, Belinostat, or Romidepsin in the same category, uh, is a cytidine, which is a drug that is being developed with a very strong interest in T cell lymphoma, combined with CHOP uh, in patients with untreated peripheral T cell lymphoma. Um, for some reasons, unfortunately, this study, despite being multicenter, was non randomized um, and only enrolled 35 patients. Therefore, the data that one can conclude from this are very, very limited. Um, very unfortunate because uh, I think this would have been a data set of high interest uh, had it been uh, appropriately uh, designed. One study in the frontline setting, which is you know, a phase one and very, very small, um, integrating the use of nivolumab in, in combination with EPOC chemotherapy was presented by Dr. Havikos from the University of Colorado. Um, and, and, and I participated to this trial. Um, so essentially this looked at uh, various uh, dose adjustments of EPOC in combination with nivolumab. The important uh, observation here is that patients were allowed to receive one cycle of chemotherapy prior to uh, study entry. Um, and then the dose adjustments for EPOC were made according to the standard use of, uh, of, uh, of the combination, uh, the regimen. Uh, patients uh, who responded, as shown here on the right, then depending on the investigator and the patient preference, could go on to uh, autotransplant um, consolidation or, or not. So there's a lot of interest in assessing both the, the efficacy and the safety of uh, uh, checkpoint inhibitors in lymphoma in general uh, and in T cell lymphoma in particular because of some specific biological circumstances that could make the, the toxicity uh, more severe in peripheral T cell lymphoma. And as expected, we observed a very significant uh, number of uh, uh, immune-related adverse events many of them leading to discontinuation of the nivolumab. However, uh, when one looks at the patients who received one cycle of chemotherapy prior to starting the nivolumab, um, actually we observed no uh, grade three or four uh, immune-related adverse events, and no, none of those patients actually had to discontinue nivolumab. 
Um, so this told us that uh, the uh, one giving one cycle of chemotherapy uh, prior to starting the checkpoint inhibitor really mitigated uh, very significantly the risk of uh, serious immune-related adverse events. And, and when we looked at the, the clinical responses, uh, it was quite encouraging with, uh, you know, of course, this is frontline therapy um, in a very small number, um, but there was a very significant number of complete responses. Um, and then, there were, you know, if you look on the right panel here, uh, there was a very interesting trend of patients who had either a partial response or even stable disease at interim PET that went on to actually have a complete response at the end of PET. So the sorry about the slides. Okay, so um, so we will continue to explore the combination with nivolumab in a follow-up study uh, with allowing, you know, actually planning for pri for therapy prior to the nivo. Um, the one information that I wanted this audience to be aware of is actually there is an, an ongoing clinical trial uh, run through the Alliance and the intergroup here in the United States. And these are randomized phase two study shown here, uh, led by Dr. Meta Shah at WashU in St. Louis. This was presented as a trial in progress at the ASCO meeting uh, last year, um, and is enrolling now uh, in the safety lead-in study with 12 patients looking at combining duvelisib, which is a PI3 kinase inhibitor, and the CHOP or CHOEP. Um, in, uh, in, the, in the phase, that, in the part of the study that will look at the randomization, uh, a total of 159 patients are planned to be enrolled. Um, and there are three arms, and they're all randomized. They're randomized one to one to one, stratified by age and by follicle helper T cell phenotype of the T cell lymphoma. Arm A and B are for patients who are less than 60 years old. And arm A patient will receive CHOEP and Duvelisib, and arm B patients will receive CHOEP and CC486, which is an oral form of azacitidine. Um, patients on arm C who are six years old or older. Um, will get regular CHOP up to six cycles. So this, this is a very important clinical trial that uh, not only will help us uh, defining better the landscape of uh, therapy frontline with these two agents that are emerging as important um, in, in the relapse refractory setting, and we want to take them to the frontline, but also because there will be a number of studies, some of them similar to the ones that Dr. Sen mentioned for the DLBCLs, like circulating tumor DNA, mutational landscape, um, and uh, tumor microenvironment. So we will learn a lot from this trial. In addition to the frontline study that I mentioned uh, when combining um, uh, nivolumab and EPOC, there are a number of uh, other studies looking at uh, integrating uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, this is a study from MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Um, they presented, this was an oral presentation. Again, small studies, 38 patients are enrolled. Uh, patients received a different type of checkpoint inhibitor called pembrolizumab in combination with romidepsin, which is a standard drug um, that has been used for peripheral T cell lymphoma. Uh, the drug lost its FDA approval, but it's still available uh, for use on a compassionate basis, and it's part of the NCC and compendium, so it's very easy to get. Um, and the primary endpoint of the study was overall response rate. Uh, overall, 28 patients completed one cycle. Uh, there were grade three adverse events, uh, mostly infections and thrombocytopenia. Um, also, patients, three patients stopped therapy due to the immune-related adverse event, which is a class-specific toxicity for these drugs. Um, the rate seems to be lower compared to the number of patients on the front line, but that also is, ex is expected. Um, and then, importantly, two patients had hyperprogression, which is a, a flare up of the lymphoma that has been described in other studies looking at uh, um, checkpoint inhibitors. Um, patients had the hyperprogression. Uh, the complete response rate was 34.2%. Importantly, all five patients who had some type of immune related adverse event remaining CR. This is consistent with this, the observation that we also made. 
in the frontline setting with NEVO EPOC that uh, uh, the patients who actually had some type of immune related adverse event, they seem to have a better response. The follow up is long, the, 33, the median follow up, 33 months plus, um, and with, you know, with the overall survival, 52.4 uh, months, and median progression free survival, 29.5 months. These are encouraging uh, sort of outcome data for uh, peripheral tissue lymphoma. And so we're looking forward to see a uh, longer follow up on this and potentially building. Um, this is another study that is looking at pembrolizumab uh, after uh, autologous stem cell transplantation. This comes from the Dana Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Um, it's a phase two. Um, and uh, mostly was feasibility here for the ability to give a checkpoint inhibitor after stem cell transplant. Feasibility was demonstrated. Um, and uh, uh, in particular, um, the, the progression free survival of 18 months after stem cell transplant um, was uh, encouraging in meeting the primary endpoint of the study. So this was a, this was a positive study, not just from the feasibility standpoint, but also from the um, efficacy standpoint. Looking at new drugs, Okay, looking at new drugs, I'm going to mention briefly a follow-up uh, of this study called PRIMO um, that has been presented before. Uh, this was a, a follow-up based on analysis of uh, responses based on prior therapies. I'm not going to go through all of this. By the way, the slides will be shared, I believe, by the LRF, um, and there, all the clinical trial information is listed at the bottom, that NCT number. You will be able to find all the information on all of these trials just by searching for that. Um, so again, this confirms uh, a very good response rate with tuvalisib oral uh, single agent therapy in patients with uh, um, uh, heavily pretreated. And this study shows that uh, you know even in patients who had more than prior more than three prior lines of therapy, uh, and also independent on the type of therapy that they received, the response rates were maintained. So you know prior therapy and number of prior therapy doesn't seem to impact response to tuvalisib is uh, encouraging. This is a, a, a study of, uh, uh, you know, oral isocytidine, the same drug that uh, was just discussed in the previous, um, in the previous study. Um, this was a randomized study uh, looking at uh, CC486 versus the investigator here, gemcitabine, bendamastin, romadepsin. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, typical endpoints, progression-free survival, overall survival, um, patients received uh, on average of 5.5 cycles of uh, CC486. Um, and this is duration of therapy that is consistent for most patients with uh, uh, relapse refractory PTCL. And in this case, angiomonoblastic. Um, and uh, so this is, doesn't look too different from what we would be expecting. Um, when we compare uh, the uh, investigational arm to the uh, bendamastin and the investigator choice, um, the study did not meet its endpoints, although I think that th this study was a little uh, excessively optimistic in uh, um, the, the, the endpoint that they selected. So there seemed to have been some benefit in terms of risk reduction, but was not adequate to call it a positive study. I'm almost done here. I want to point uh, to another drug that uh, is a fairly advanced in development, although with not, nothing was presented at ASH. It's called Valimetostat. It's an EZH1-2 inhibitor. Um, the phase one was completed, shown here on top of this slide, showing very strong signal of efficacy with really, really favorable safety profile. Um, and this was followed by a phase two, fairly large phase two study called Valentine. And this study has completed enrollment now. We're just waiting for the data. Um, and you know, the preliminary analysis looks quite encouraging. So this is the drug that uh, you know may be uh, all on the potentially approved down down the road. Thank you. This is my last slide. Appreciate it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Porku. Um, we'll now jump in uh, to questions and just to. As a reminder, in case anyone asked, um, this is being recorded and will be sent um, out to you via email. 
um, either today or tomorrow, so you can look out for that um, so you don't have to write anything down. And if you miss something, you can always go back and watch it. Um, and we'll get through as many questions as we can. Um, if your questions here don't get answered and they're more related to your disease subtype, you can always join um, one of our Ask a Doctor programs or other um, webinars. But to start off, um, I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Sen. Uh, someone said, thank you for your presentation. Is there a current plan for blood tests to be used to identify relapse lymphoma in Canada? Are there any options currently available for, somewhere, for someone to get these tests? Yes, that, that's a, a good question. So one of the things I was talking about was circulating tumor DNA, which is, is a blood test that may allow us in the future to detect <clears throat> sorry, lymphoma at a lower level or earlier. Right now, this is still considered a research test. So you, you might have the opportunity to participate in a local trial. There are many centers that are trying to collect these data and trying to validate these tests to prove that they are going to add extra information beyond the tests that we currently do. So I would say right now it's not considered a standard test, but if you have the opportunity to participate in some of the ongoing research where these are being measured, then I would strongly recommend you to do so. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sen. Um, Dr. Porku, someone asked how soon will Mozunatizumab be available to treat patients in U.S. cancer centers. Um, any estimate will be great. I'm sorry, which drug? I, I missed it. It's Mozunatizumab, M-O-S-U-N-E-T-U-Z-U-M-A-B. Yeah. Well, it, as uh, uh, Dr. Sen mentioned in her presentation, uh, Mosinotuzumab is approved, was very recently approved for the treatment of follicular lymphoma. Um, so I'm actually I'm going to defer to Dr. Sen to make any comments about, about that. Yeah, I would imagine that it will be relatively shortly. So from the time of FDA approval, there is a, a bit of a lag, as you know, the company. Um, works on distribution and, and pricing and, and gets the mechanism in motion. But um, I would imagine that, you know, within months, if not less, that this should become actively available. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Porku, could you comment briefly on the improvement um, in survival rate over the past 10 plus years? Yeah, so I think that uh, perhaps the best thing I can say is that uh, we are just barely now starting to gather reliable data about um, survival um, in peripheral T cell lymphoma, that therefore making any comparison uh, between um, time windows is, is, is very difficult. Um, there are studies that are, have looked at that and have, they have been published. Typically, these are from you know, institutions that have very, kind of very large uh, patient volume uh, or uh, institutions that, or, or network like uh, the British uh, Cancer Columbia uh, organization where there is a standardized approach to lymphoma uh, and uh, and they have the benefit of actually being able to go back and look at uh, patients treated in different decades, you know, following a, a, a consistent. So, but that is a very uh, that is uh, the, the exception. I, I would say for the most part, um, is very difficult to compare treatment. What we know is what we know is this that uh, based on phase two for the most part data. Um, and uh, and uh, and uh, most of them not randomized. Um, looks like it's since the introduction of uh, autologous stem cell transplant consolidation, the cure rate uh, or the progression for survival at three years um, seems to have improved uh, compared to historical being you know 30 percent to perhaps being 45 uh, to 50 percent. Um, so I think that there has been an improvement, um, and it's it's uh, it's it's encouraging. We just don't really have very very tight solid uh, data um, in the relapse refractory setting. I would say, unfortunately, based on all the information that we are looking at, uh, the progression for survival um, still remains 
less than six months, and even in some of these new drug studies that I just show, it seems to be stuck, you know, at that at that number. So we are really going to have to start looking at, you know, how combinations probably therapies um, before we see some improvement in the relapse refractory setting. Great, thank you. Um... Dr. Sun, did you mention that there was um, a new form of immunotherapy treatment for follicular lymphoma just approved by the FDA? If so, what is the name of that immunotherapy treatment? I can't remember if you or um, I think uh, mm -hmm. you had might have touched on follicular, so we just want to check. Correct. So um, as we had discussed, mosanituzumab is a kind of immunotherapy, so it's a bispecific antibody. And it has just recently been approved in the last several weeks for patients with follicular lymphoma who have had at least two prior lines of treatment. So this is a, a really big step forward because it's uh, probably the first major <clears throat> indication that we've seen for a bispecific antibody. I think that it's probably the first of many. We expect that you know there'll be many indications probably coming forward in different types of lymphoma. And more broadly, you know, it's a class of, of immunotherapy that's being tested in many cancers. So I think this is very exciting. It will open up, you know, the first real large scale clinical experience with these drugs. And, um, and I think it'll be a, a big step forward for managing follicular lymphoma. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Porfu, someone had asked um, if there were any updates um, in anything related to um, COVID and lymphoma. This person asked uh, particularly for Waldenstrom's, but if there's anything else kind of, of, of note to mention. Yeah, I think that we're, you know, we're still dealing with, uh, with COVID, uh, obviously, um, and uh, I think we've learned a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's not something that we can just, you know, shake off uh, at this point. I think that the learn on the learning side, I think that we know now that, that there are certain groups of patients that uh, were uh, at, at least at the higher risk of severe complications from COVID. Um, I'm talking about patients with CLL, for example, uh, or patients with uh, other types of indolent uh, B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, um, patients who had a stem cell transplant, uh, for example, for uh, either lymphoma or multiple myeloma. Um, I think that we know that uh, you know most you know most of our patients are now vaccinated uh, and boosted, um, and uh, I think that the question now is going to be uh, you know whether or not additional what the efficacy of additional boosts are going to be. Uh, well, one of the things that we're doing here uh, in our institution is we're following up uh, all patients uh, who have, you know, had vaccinations with uh, serologies to see w what their response to the vaccine has been and what the titer is. So we're learning and we're collecting those data. So we're learning how effective the vaccine actually is. So it's not just enough to get it. The question is whether you're responding to it. And one of the things we've learned is that, uh, uh, you know, CLL, uh, patients, they have a, definitely they have a uh, very very minimal response to to the vaccine, and I think strategies to try to improve that is something that definitely would be worthwhile exploring. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, Dr. Sen, uh, we had one directed towards you. Um, have you stopped referring mantle cell lymphoma patients? Do high dose chemotherapy and auto stem cell transplant, or are you waiting for the triangle abstract to be published? You know, so personally, here at our center, we are waiting for the triangle abstract to get more data. I think this is a major decision that needs to be made. Um, and, you know, I think one of the caveats with that study is that it is standard, for example, for patients to get two years of maintenance after the transplant, maintenance rituximab, and only about half of the people 
in this study received maintenance rituximab based on the timing of when it was done and be nice to kind of pull apart some of the data and look specifically at those that are currently getting our full standard of care and you know including the maintenance rituximab and to see if the same message came forward so that's probably one piece of information we're looking at uh, but i think it is it is going to be a major decision so um, hard to base that on on sort of the initial presentation but probably it will take a you know a, a much closer look and and but it you know if people can access the BTK inhibitor, I think it is definitely worth a discussion right now with um, with their doctors because you know the data is quite compelling. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Sen, um, and thank you, Dr. Porku, for you know taking your time to go over everything today. I know it was a lot of information, um, but uh, this was really really thorough and really well done. And for anyone who um, had any questions or wanted um, any you know, reminders about any of the studies that they talked about. Once again, um, once we send this, you can definitely um, go through and watch it again. And if any of your questions weren't answered, you can also join us for one of our um, upcoming Ask the Doctor programs, uh, which will have three on newly diagnosed relapse refractory and uh, treatment options and clinical trials. So you can always kind of attend one of those and ask your questions um, again, and you can find information for that on the site. But um, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Borku and Dr. Sen. Um, this has been uh, great, and we really appreciate you being here with us today. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. It was my pleasure.